Ja, vielen Dank, Stefan, für die schöne Einführung und den Bogen, ähm, der schon äh, ja, auch inhaltlich ein bisschen den Bogen spannt. Ähm, ich werde äh, den Vortrag auf Englisch halten. Äh, zum einen, weil die Forschung äh, insgesamt immer auf Englisch stattgefunden hat und äh, weil es vielleicht noch dem einen oder anderen äh, den Zugang ermöglicht. Ähm, äh, genau, so I will switch to English here. Um, yes, as Stefan alluded to, I will talk about the sense of self and uh, specifically about how the um, self experience is modulated uh, during uh, deeper meditative states. And um, as a background for the for the study that I will present, on the one hand, we have the uh, approach of neurophenomenology, uh, which Stefan also mentioned. Um, which is a research program uh, developed or suggested by Francisco Varela, Chilean biologist and neuroscientist. Um, and he introduced neurophenomenology um, as a potential remedy to the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, so um, I assume that most of you are aware of the um, hard problem of consciousness, um, the, the kind of um, principle concern about how can it be that we have a conscious experience while there is apparently only kind of um, physical stuff going on. How do these two domains come together? together. Um, and he suggested neurophenomenology as a pragmatic way to deal with that. So it's not about a theoretical fix or a theoretical answer, it's just about a certain way to engage in research practices that might at some point um, kind of um, solve this problem or change this problem. Um, and his point of departure was that experience is a kind of primary and in the science of the mind we do, um, we are kind of um, bound to deal with it if we want it or not. So any signs of cognition and mind must sooner or later come to grips with the basic condition that we have no idea what the mental or the cognitive could possibly be apart from our own experience of it. And um, in a later paper, he says, to deprive our scientific examination of this phenomenal realm, this uh, realm of lived experience, amounts to amputating life of its most intimate domains. Um, so we do need to um, um, kind of dive or, or deal systematically and explicitly with experience, with the way we experience um, attention, emotions, thoughts, and so on, if we want to um, do a science of these phenomena. And uh, the way to go about that, according for, uh, to Varela, would be to engage in a circulation between uh, so-called third-person pers uh, third person perspective and a first-person perspective. So um, on the one hand, we have a direct experience of these phenomena um, and uh, we can investigate that. On the other hand, we can uh, look at neural data, at neurophysiological data, at behavioral data, um, at things we can kind of um, intersubjectively uh, observe. And um, and then switch between these perspectives and allow them to mutually inform each other. And I hope that the presentation today will provide an example of how that can be done. And uh, what he suggested is that we need um, methodologies to also engage in this first person inquiry. And on the one hand, um, uh, he suggested that uh, meditative training um, to do that as it allows uh, to get um, or to, to familiarize oneself uh, with mental processes. Um, on the other hand, um, the idea was that it would allow to a more stable uh, mode of attention to investigate experience and also to stabilize certain experiential states if we want to look at them from the third person perspective. And he also um, relates to the phenomenological approach, the, the um, um, approach in uh, philosophy, uh, for example, where he um, borrows the term of the epoche, the idea that we need to suspend our beliefs about experience and 
kind of engage in a more uh, fresh look at um, what our mind is doing. Uh, and I can really suggest uh, the original paper by Varela if you're interested in that, um, but we also published um, uh, a more recent review of um, the work that has been done so far in neurophenomenology and um, also discussed um, part of what I will present you today in that, in that review. Um, and in that review, we also kind of um, system, um, systematize the, the, um, what you can actually do when circulated between these um, two domains. So for example, you can um, use the first person perspective to actually validate something that you have found uh, through third person research. Uh, so if you found some difference between uh, experimental conditions, you can um, validate if that actually corresponds to, let's say different emotional states or modes of attention. Um, on the other hand, you can use knowledge gained from the subjective side, the first person side to inform the design of experimental studies. Um, you can also use um, the first person knowledge to inform the analysis of your data to kind of build subgroups of subjects, for example, or of trials. Um, and on the other hand, you could also use a first person, uh, a third person knowledge to contrast um, certain reports on the first person side. Um, we are currently doing that in a project here in, in, at the IGPP actually. And all of that can be a reiterative process. So you can, um, for example, um, knowledge that you have gained on the third person side through the help of first person knowledge, you can use that again to look back at the first person side. So um, the idea again is that this is an, an ongoing process. And uh, one of the more um, overarching aims would be to build uh, cognitive models or mathematical models, which are not only linked or based on third person data, but which are also really um, kind of um, honest to how we experience the world. And in that paper, we also suggest that um, or, um, a, a dimension of um, different methods of uh, how to investigate methods of um, phenomenology. So for example, just um, self-report ratings. And on the, on the other hand, you can have uh, methods that go more into the thickness of experience and um, for example, using uh, phenomenological interviews really inquire in, into the, the structure of, of a certain experience. Um, on the other hand, uh, important for um, the presentation today is the theme of the embodied sense of self. So um, here we are talking about um, uh, something that has to be distinguished from the narrative or autobiographical self. So there's a lot of research in psychology about how we have certain knowledge about our past, how we project ourselves into the future, um, and uh, how we can uh, reflect about ourselves, have ideas about our abilities, um, and so on. Um, so the embodied self is what you kind of remain with once you drop these um, levels of self-reflection and so on. So it is not extended in time. It's not about ideas about your past or your future, it's just about your momentary experience and it's not reflective, it's um, pre-reflective. It's um, for example, when you're engaged in a certain task and uh, a certain activity in the world, you do have a certain sense of um, being an embodied agent who is doing that um, task. So as features of the embodied self, um, usually uh, there is, uh, or the, the sense of agency is considered one of the features. So the sense that you're actively in control of your body, of your actions, and the sense of ownership that you're somehow identified with your body, um, which you can uh, sometimes when um, you're, um, uh, um, vascular uh, circulation is interrupted, you have a sense of your um, uh, leg or your arm, which is uh, somehow feels not connected uh, to yourself as an object in the world. And 
Um, on the other hand, uh, two aspects uh, central to the embodied self are the sense of being located somewhere in space, usually inside the body, and um, having a perspective onto the world. Um, and this is the, the embodied self is, a, is a, uh, a broad field of research and open questions, questions are if there are more minimal uh, experiential states um, deprived of these um, more uh, gross em embodied experience of a self. Um, so for example, there's the concept of minimal phenomenal experience of um, Thomas Metzinger or of so-called non-dual states which lack um, subject object um, structures. And um, on the other hand, um, there are some ideas about the neural and computational processes uh, involved in the embodied self, but it's really hard to evaluate that because it's quite hard to modulate or to, um, to completely suspend the embodied self. So there's some research in um, virtual reality um, used to manipulate certain um, sensory information that somehow contribute to our sense of self. But this is just a kind of a modulation and not a full suspension. So it's hard to have like different experimental conditions um, that would allow to really contrast um, uh, the embodied self to uh, let's say non-embodied state. And here research on meditation might be fruitful. Um, so there is already quite a lot on, of evidence that um, these more conceptual processes regarding the self are suspended in meditation. And that's maybe not very su surprising. If you just pay attention to your breath, for example, you don't engage in self-referential thinking and so on. Um, there is also some research to, uh, that shows that um, the uh, experience of the embodied self is modulated in meditation. So for example, it has been shown that short mindfulness states lead to a soften softening of the bodily boundaries and um, there are a few neurophysiological studies of so-called non-dual states. However, these usually lack a more um, in-depth characterization of what's actually happening in the experience of, um, of these subjects. Um, so here the, the sense of boundaries comes in um, as an operational definition of changes in the embodied and pre-reflective sense of self during meditation. And um, here the idea would be that um, it kind of characterizes what happens um, when you also uh, suspend these um, yeah, more um, uh, uh, pre-reflective aspects of the embodied self. And um, that might allow us to also look at um, uh, what kind of remains um, in states that are devoid of um, more gross features. And um, this concept of the sense of boundaries was kind of bootstrapped in a dialogue between um, neuroscientists and, and psychologists, um, including Aviva Bekovic Johanna in, in Haifa, and, um, and a expert meditator or meditation teacher. And he came up with the idea that this is something that is kind of um, reliably altered um, during meditation. And what they did in the first study was just to describe phenomenologically what he means by that or um, what actually is altered. And um, through a phenomenological interview, they um, described several dimensions, uh, for example, um, the sense of agency or um, the sense of being somewhat centered somewhere which increasingly dissolve when he goes into deeper states of meditation. And in a um, subsequent study, they um, asked him to go into these states in a um, kind of um, uh, um, continuous fashion um, or increasing with increasing uh, depth. And uh, while he was measured with um, MEG, so um, looking at um, neural activity, and uh, what they found was that in parietal, uh, lateral parietal regions um, and in medial parietal regions, there was a decrease of activity in the higher beta band. Um, and 
um, this um, decrease um, was stronger um, with uh, deeper states of um, boundary dissolution. So um, for the current study, so this is kind of the, the um, starting point for the current study. And one question was whether we could replicate uh, these results and generalize them to a larger sample. And also whether we would um, find similar dis uh, phenomenological descriptions. Um, then we also um, asked uh, what would be a condition where um, someone would actively maintain the sense of boundaries in meditation. And this is relevant because sometimes the experience of boundary dissolution can be also experienced as something threatening. Um, so the um, possibility of actively maintaining that um, was also of interest. Um, we were also interested in um, neural mechanisms which would underlie this experience. Um, and um, finally, we wanted to address whether there are any kind of real life implications of um, the ability to regulate the sense of boundaries. So whether the ability to um, volitionally manipulate or alter the sense of boundaries would um, be associated with different levels of well-being or um, different ways of social processing. Um, and uh, for the study, we recruited a sample of 46 uh, long-term meditators with quite a diverse um, amount of uh, meditative experience. So ranging from one to 30 years and a mean of um, 3,000 hours um, with up to uh, something like 20, uh, 25,000 hours for the most experienced meditators. And um, all of them um, got a three weeks training um, by the uh, meditation teacher who uh, participated in the previous studies. Um, so this uh, was meant to allow them to become familiar with uh, this concept of boundary dissolution as it's, it's, not a, it's not a traditional practice or it's a phenomenologically um, defined concept. And together they inquired into different techniques, how they could actually modulate that. Um, then they completed a bunch of questionnaires and then they came to the lab two times. In the first session, we uh, measured MEG uh, while they were um, going into these meditative states. And in a second lab session, we measured um, or we applied behavioral tasks, uh, looking at empathy and compassion um, empathic accuracy and outgroup bias. And this uh, study is really um, um, managed uh, and, and with a lot of energy by Joachim Schweitzer, who is a PhD student uh, in the lab in Haifa. Um, and for this um, MEG uh, session, which uh, will be the, the focus of this presentation, the meditators, they um, uh, engaged in uh, states of boundary dissolution um, on the one hand and boundary maintenance on the other hand. So um, this is here referred to as SP plus and SP minus and uh, just default resting state where they are not asked to um, do anything uh, specifically. And um, this was uh, repeated several times. Um, so we had uh, five minutes um, uh, separate minutes of each of the states. And after the max session, they completed phenomenological interviews um, for 30 to 50 minutes. And um, these involved open questions, uh, but also pre uh, questions focusing on predetermined aspects of um, aspects of the embodied self. So agency, first person perspective and location. And um, yeah, these were uh, the interviews were analyzed um, according to classical um, qualitative analysis. Um, and I think maybe um, can be highlighted that uh, the classification of the interviews into different uh, categories that you will see in a minute uh, was done by uh, several judges. So at, uh, for each participant, there were at least two judges. So we could calculate uh, an interrater. Um, um, uh, agreement and 
Um, and regarding that, this is quite an abstract and kind of subtle uh, material. Um, we had, um, I think, a um, yeah, nice interrater agreement. Um, and these uh, phenomenological interviews, the analysis was done by Ohad Nava, also a um, PhD student at Haifa. And the phenomenological results are also already published uh, in this article here. So first, um, regarding the phenomenology, um, we extracted different techniques or uh, let's say mental gestures that participants used to uh, go into these states of boundary dissolution. So for the uh, maintenance of, of boundaries, they um, uh, checked into different sensations or scanned different sensations in the body. Um, they visualized um, their bodily form and uh, or they just dwelled in their boundaries or um, yeah, within um, their bodily boundaries actually. And in the um, dissolution states, um, they also um, sometimes focused on sensations, but in a much more unconstrained um, way. And uh, more often they turned attention outwards, just into um, outer space. Um, they imagine just certain imaginations, like uh, kind of a feeling of um, expansion. And what was uh, used uh, most frequently were, were gestures of relaxation. So to just um, disengage from, uh, to on the one hand relax the body, but also disengage from kind of any kind of uh, mental effort um, or mental um, focused mental actions. And um, additionally, we um, came up with a set of phenomenological categories and I will go through them uh, in a minute. Um, and these categories, um, they span a phenomenological space. Um, so in the um, uh, condition of uh, ma boundary maintenance, um, we find that within that space, participants were much more um, kind of homogeneously distributed. And in the um, boundary dissolution states, we see um, quite a lot of um, variety of experiences. So I think this already kind of shows how it, is, it can be helpful to actually map the, uh, the experiential state. Otherwise, we would just kind of lump them all together into the same um, analysis. Um, so for um, under maintenance, I'll just um, shortly present one example where the meditator says, I begin with breathing and I base my focus there. And then I notice different parts of the body, the hands, the head, there was some pressure there. I attend all contact points of the body with the surface and blanket. So it's like the boundaries are at the periphery of my body. So he's just checking different sensations in the body and um, feels kind of centered. His, his center of attention is centered somewhere inside the body and he's attending um, kind of um, yeah, these, uh, to these sensations. Um, in the um, dissolution states, um, as I mentioned before, we find much more um, uh, variability. And for um, the first category um, called agency, um, there were three different levels. In the first kind of default level, there's an active sense of agency. So here uh, one meditator says, um, my action is to try and keep blowing up this balloon. It's like a struggle between this, the centering gravitational force, force and the attempt to really push the dividing line outwards. So he is, he's really kind of actively trying to do something. In, a, uh, in the second category, which is kind of an intermediate category, um, uh, the participant says, I'm still directed towards a certain task. There's an agenda, like an easy effort without ambition. And finally, in the last category, um, the sense of agency is totally suspended um, or passive. So here, um, the participant says, a deep breath and then everything loses its grip. Until now I was putting an artificial barrier over sensations and now it's possible 
to let go of this barrier and let it extend. So, um, yeah, I think it's clear that it's it's a very passive um, state and also the usage of language here, he's uh, really using um, um, only passive sentences. Um, the second category um, is about um, how they experience themselves being located. Um, I think I'll jump directly to the, um, so in the, in the default um, category, they are located um, within the body um, or in the, um, which actually wasn't the case for anybody, um, but um, most of the participants experience to be located somewhat in the body and the close space surrounding the body. And uh, some participants had a sense of expanding into a larger space. And for a few of them, um, 12 participants, um, the structure, the spatial structure of being located somewhere um, kind of collapsed. So here um, he says, there's no longer me. It stops being separate. It's not me melting on the bed. There's no me and there's no bed, all melts together. Um, another quote is, it's a space that's empty. There's nothing in it. Um, the third category is about um, the first person perspective, how yeah, they experienced um, themselves as being um, oriented towards the world. And again, I'll jump into the uh, last category um, where we had a few participants which reported um, a more kind of um, radical loss of any differentiation between subject object um, structures. So here he says, there's no sense of observer, no witness. It didn't lose the sense of being part of, not entirely. There's a sense of flow and it goes through something. Um, one category that came up in the analysis process is the attention category. So um, here we found that um, there, uh, the mode of attention was really central in, um, in the way they uh, experienced their boundaries. So uh, in more kind of ordinary states, um, the focus of attention was already opened, but was um, still dynamic. So checking into different um, locations. Um, and then it became increasingly static. Um, and for the participants um, reporting a more radical um, dissolution, um, their attention kind of um, lost all its, its form or, or direction. Um, so here uh, the participant says, attention flows with everything. It's nowhere, but it's also not lost. A kind of very, very strong sensory experience of flowing and unraveling of all that was condensed. Um, uh, another category was related to how they experienced the body. Um, and here I'll just say that this was kind of spanned from experiencing the body as a concrete um, bounded form um, with local and specific sensations um, to more indistinct bodily feelings to um, finally non-local feelings with no references to a concrete body. Um, and um, inter interestingly, there were still um, quite strong um, affective experiences, which in the majority of cases were experienced as a positive state. Um, but there were also a few cases with uh, negative experiences. So um, here the uh, participant says, I felt my heart pounding as if I'm in a dramatic moment of my life, uh, really even slightly intimidating in intensity. I feel like being in a closed room all day and then opening the door and realizing I'm above a jungle. Um, and on the other hand, the more positive experiences were usually described as a calm state of, of peace and um, relaxation. Here he says, I felt more security or calm, like it's my home. Being without boundaries generated some sort of serenity of spaciousness. So um, having established these phenomenological categories and this phenomenological space, we were interested in how this, uh, they would relate to each other, um, whether 
the dissolution would be more a unitary phenomenon. So if you experience, let's say, a loss of agency, would you also experience a loss of um, being located? Or would there be different clusters um, of participants um, experiencing the one uh, type of dissolution versus another type? And um, what you can already see here is that um, they are more or less aligned on the diagonal, which goes uh, through the space. And this is also what we find in the uh, quantitative analysis. So all of these categories are quite strongly uh, correlated and only the uh, valence category is independent. Um, and this is also um, shown here in this network analysis. So um, you can see that all of the categories are quite strongly interrelated. Uh, when we look at the partial correlation network, so um, kind of regressing out all the other nodes of the network while looking at a certain connection, we find that um, the first person or the, the loss of first person perspective is um, kind of related um, or um, kind of arrived at perhaps through two different routes. One is um, a loss of location. And another one is a drop in agency and active control of attention. So there seems to be, um, while there is a lot of um, commonality, there seem to be two different kind of uh, ways of entering that. Um, yeah, and because there is so much commonality, we were able to just uh, compute a summary score of the different um, categories, which we use for um, further analysis. And one was that we just tested the effect of different techniques. So um, here we find that the technique of relaxation actually um, has the largest effect on this overall um, dissolution score. Um, so the, the gestures of just uh, letting go control of attention, letting go um, uh, tension in the, mass, in, in the, in the body uh, was driving the, the depth of dissolution. And um, the overall depth of dissolution was also strongly correlated with um, the amount of um, previous meditation pra practice. Um, and for the neural results, um, we had quite clear hypotheses. Um, on the one hand, um, or uh, in general, that um, the high beta band power would be reduced in the um, dissolution states compared to rest and also compared to um, the state of actively maintaining the boundaries. And um, for this uh, confirmatory um, analysis, we defined a subsample of full dissolvers um, based on the criteria of having the highest rating on the agency, the location and first person perspective dimensions. So those dimensions which are Kind of defining the embodied uh, self and to have a, the second highest ratings on the other dimensions. So these are here in the figure, the, uh, the red um, dots here, the, the guys in the upper quadrant of the, of the space. Um, and these analyses were uh, pre-registered and we blinded ourselves also to the um, assignment or to, to the uh, different conditions of boundary dissolution while analyzing the data. Uh, so what we find is um, comparing the dissolution states to rest, we find quite a broadband reduction in power. And this reduction peaks at um, the high beta range exactly actually in the same at the same frequency, um, which we found in, in, the, in the single case study. Um, and uh, this was associated, this de decrease was associated with a widespread uh, central, um, uh, centrally localized pattern. And um, it actually um, decreased from rest to maintenance to the um, dissolution condition. And these decreases um, were located or, or were, um, uh, according to, to source localizers, were. Um, located in medial parietal regions, um, in lateral parietal regions, and um, also frontal parietal uh, regions. 
and comparing the dissolution stage to the maybe more high level control condition of um, the maintenance uh, state, um, we find um, uh, more specific uh, or more focal decreases in power, which however also peak at um, uh, 27 Hertz in the, in the high better range. And uh, they have a very similar um, spatial, spatial origin. So um, also the, the topographic organization really um, corresponds nicely to the previous findings and they overlap with uh, research based on um, virtual reality on embodied selfhood, which um, has um, kind of singled out regions that integrate information, multisensory information um, about the body and um, the surrounding space. Um, so these uh, results that I showed so far were from this um, subsample of full dissolvers, um, which we defined phenomenologically. Um, then we also looked at uh, what we would see in the full sample. Um, um, and um, here we actually also find a decrease um, in a similar frequency range. Um, however, with a more um, focal um, localization and when we directly contrast the full dissolvers against the, the remaining sample, we find um, the PCC. Um, <laughs> um, so in these parietal regions, um, the decrease in uh, activity was stronger in the full dissolvers. And we find that these um, decreases in the, the PCC and the cortex um, Lots of the precunius, um, they are correlated with, um, or um, yeah, with um, these different phenomenological dimensions um, of the first person perspective, location, and uh, the overall dissolution scores, as well as the uh, amount of meditative practice. Um, and this is also actually found on a whole brain analysis, so that kind of just corroborates the finding. Um, however, we don't find any association with um, psychometric measures. So with the self ratings, which they gave after each epoch um, and also with um, a psychometric scale of ocean oceanic boundlessness, which might be the closest um, corresponding measure to our phenomenological data. May I ask one quick question? Uh, in all the lower right graphs, the points, uh, behind the boxes or beneath the boxes, the black box on the top right. Uh, this, are, are these points? Yeah. They're, they're uh, this, points. this one is also is yeah. one meditator, yeah. And how, how is the correlation if you remove them? Um, these correlations... Um, yeah, they, they look fine. They, but, they are but fine, the but um, this one is actually, um, is not significant anymore without that guy. Without so. This one. Um, it's it's still in the same direction, but it's um, very much driven by this. Um, he's somehow the, the um, most expert meditator, and uh, but yeah, really drives these okay. results. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah um, so far, what I showed is um, was about the the beta band um, where we found the peak reductions. Uh, we also looked at um, other the other canonical frequency bands and. Um, what you see here is that for the more high level comparison of the solution versus maintenance, um, the reduction is specific to the better band, to the high better band. Um, looking at the full sample, we also, we have more power, I guess, and we find reductions in the better, in the delta band and um, some small reductions also in the low gamma band, which I think is just a spread of what we see here. Um, then finally, we also looked at connectivity. Um, this, these are just uh, preliminary analyses, but um, what uh, we seem to find is that uh, well, first I should, um, can, uh, canonical parcellation of the brain into different networks. Um, so um, here we have, um, for example, the sensory motor network, we have um, dorsal attention networks, um, 
and so on. And what we find is that the integrity of the uh, somato motor and the dorsal attention network is reduced. So the, the within network um, connectedness, um, so to say, is reduced. And the uh, segregation of the network, the, the strength of coupling to other um, regions of the brain is also reduced. So um, we do have kind of a um, breakdown of connectivity within these networks. Um, Finally, uh, the last question uh, or um, part of the result addresses the question of relationship with well being and social behavior. So, here the background is that a change in the sense of self is often regarded as an aim of uh, practice. However, there's also some reports that this can be um, sometimes experienced as adverse um, or even as debilitating. Um, so, we were interested in uh, yeah, whether um, larger um, modulation of the sense of boundary would be related positively or negatively to well-being. Um, and also there's a lot of theory about, and also some empirical research that um, processes related to the embodied self um, are crucial in um, social processing. Um, for example, in, in um, empathic sharing, we have this embodied resonance with others. So um, we were interested whether um, a modulation of the sense of boundaries would somehow influence how we um, respond to um, social affairs. And uh, to address these questions, we computed a neural dissolution score. Um, and we also used the, um, this phenomenological dissolution score. So the neural dissolution score was just defined as the induced difference uh, within this region, which was kind of most um, tightly related to the phenomenology of dissolution. And what we find is that it actually relates to, um, as, so the, the increased, uh, the induced difference relates positively to um, the amount of positive affect experienced in daily life. And um, this is the case for both the neural and the phenomenological measures. And it also correlates positively to compassion, which we measured in a, in a video-based task where participants were confronted with videos of suffering and um, just rated how much compassion they felt. Um, however, we didn't find uh, correlations with um, measures of empathic accuracy, how well they um, labeled emotions and also with outgroup bias. Um, So um, to sum up the results, what we find um, on the side of the phenomenology is um, that we um, could validate the previous descriptions of boundary dissolution um, and also extend that, for example, um, with the, the importance of um, different modes of attention. Um, and and um, yeah, mainly we show that of minimal self-experience suspended in these states. Um, and what seems to remain is um, a, a certain tone of uh, affective tone and um, certain kind of unconstrained, unstructured bodily feelings. Um, and uh, what these results also add, I think, is that um, suspension of agentic and intentional engagement is really essential in driving the depth of dissolution. On the side of neurophysiology, neurophysi we find that a reduction in high beta power is a robust marker of um, boundary dissolution, and that specifically the reductions in um, medial parietal regions index for dissolution states. Um, so I would like to discuss these results a little bit with respect to the uh, neurophenomenological approach. Um, and um, on the one hand, I think, uh, yeah, there have been actually quite few real serious implementations of neurophenomenology. And I think this is a first step in showing that neurophenomenology can produce or might be able to reduce, uh, to produce robust and replicable results. Um, and I think the approach in quantifying the phenomenological results um, seems promising. So um, 
this does not have to remain on a level of qualitative descriptions, but you can actually um, use that to um, describe relationships quantitatively. Um, also combining um, pre-registration with um, blinded analysis allowed us to process these um, different kinds of data, which are both quite demanding and, and processing uh, in parallel and uh, still um, adhere to a confirmatory approach. Um, then I think it's quite interesting that um, the um, kind of uh, uh, deep or rich uh, phenomenological measures um, or, or data from the interviews um, were associated with the neural results, but we didn't find anything for the more thin measures of um, uh, self-report and, and questionnaires. Uh, so I think that especially for experiences, experiences such as um, embodied selfhood, um, it seems to be really uh, fruitful to go more deeply into, um, into pre-reflective levels of experience. And um, yeah, overall, I think that the study shows a success, successful implementation of several of the bridges between the neural and the phenomenological domain. Um, but um, there are, of course, additional bridges which can be explored. Um, and we are currently working on a neurofeedback study where we want to use the, these neural markers um, to give them back in real time to the participants so they can actually explore what that means in terms of their experience um, in a real time uh, fashion. So that would even link these uh, neural um, changes or, or processes more closely to what's going on in experience. And uh, finally, I want to discuss uh, our findings um, with the idea of aiming at a mechanistic model of embodied selfhood. And here, um, there, are, there is already, of course, a lot of literature or ideas about what kind of processes are involved. So on the one hand, we have uh, the idea that multisensory content there, integration um, is um, important for specifying our self-location and our first-person perspective. So this is based, um, as I mentioned before, on virtual reality research, where you can um, kind of um, experimentally modulate the, the visual perspective, the tactile sensations, and how they go together. And um, by doing that, you can, for example, induce out-of-body experiences. Um, another idea is that um, uh, motor control processes where you have um, predictions of the consequences of your actions, um, that this is uh, essential in uh, specifying um, the self as an embodied agent. So here the idea is that you have, um, usually you just have events um, going on in the world and um, you have afferent processes in the brain which process these events. On the other hand, you can have efferences, um, signals um, that travel from the brain to the um, effectors, um, to the muscles and, and create changes in the world. And one theoretical idea is that um, re-efferences, um, the changes you created yourself in the world are used to or, or kind of implicitly specify yourself as an embodied agent. So I think this becomes clear if you just think about eye movements. Um, every eye movement creates huge changes in your uh, sensory, visual sensory data. And um, these, uh, the, the prediction of these changes or the successful prediction of these changes um, kind of specifies yourself as an agent causing these chain, uh, changes. And um, then there's ideas about um, more or less the same process happening inside uh, the body. So you're regulating bodily processes and um, successfully predicting those changes um, is thought to create an effective perspective on the world. And finally, um, again, a similar process uh, is thought to happen with cognitive control and the control of attention. So uh, by actively regulating your attention, you're also regulating internal states and um, when you can successfully do that, you experience yourself as a mental agent um, that is playing with thoughts and paying attention to this or that. Um, 
so what happens uh, in meditation is that on one hand you have uh, stillness of the body and relaxation of the body so by that you already have um, quite a strong reduction of self-generated sensory input and of multi-sensory contingencies. Um, also, you have acceptance of emotions and physical sensations. So this would also reduce active, active regulation of um, bodily and emotional states. And finally, as I've shown in, in our phenomenological data, um, especially in these states of deeper dissolution, you have um, a suspension of active control of attention. Um, have what we call formless attention, where um, the, the kind of um, focusing on different sensations or objects is dropped. Um, and um, here this is a, is a quote from the predictive processing literature um, saying that the agent or self in its present form will cease to exist if another model has to be chosen as a better explanation of sensory input. So um, just theoretically, I think this is quite um, um, uh, yeah, parsimonious in terms of uh, predicting these uh, changes which uh, we see in meditation. We are currently um, using cognitive tasks to, to target these mechanisms. Um, uh, for example, using a sensory suppression task where we look at the, the phenomenon that if you create a certain um, sensory effect, like a, just a tone through a button press, the neural response to that tone is uh, smaller uh, if you created it yourself. So this is the effect of being able to predict um, the, the consequences of your action. And so we are checking if um, this is modulated through these states of um, boundary dissolution. Um, however, I think that also already the, the results that I presented present some support for the involvement of these uh, mechanisms. As I said, the, the suspension of um, active motor control, cognitive and attentional engagement, um, I think supports this idea um, that there is that a, a suspension of such control contributes to the solution. Um, on the other hand, um, we have to ask what is the role of these oscillatory changes? And uh, here there's um, the idea that uh, beta oscillations carry top down predictions, uh, whereas uh, faster frequencies um, are associated with. Um, uh, corresponding uh, prediction errors. And uh, together with the top topographic um, pattern of our results, I think this kind of supports the idea that you have a reduction in um, prediction of um, multi-sensory multi contingencies. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, also with the involvement of um, sensory motor regions, there might also be um, a reduction in um, these um, efference copies in these predictions of um, consequences of uh, motor action, um, perhaps through like uh, subtle control of, of tension in the body and so on. Um, and finally, better signals are also associated with um, um, gain uh, control. So uh, this is a, um, the kind of um, prediction processing uh, control or, or corresponding uh, mechanism to attention. Uh, so um, this does also um, fit the idea that uh, reduction in, atten in attentional control is involved. So while these um, results and ideas, they do not really disentangle these mechanisms, um, I think that um, they, this is not an accident, but that they might actually be really tightly interrelated. So uh, so there is not just kind of a module in the brain which um, calls your yourself as an embodied um, uh, object somewhere um, that's located somewhere, but um, that uh, these codings of your self as an as an body located somewhere are really uh, mutually dependent with uh, active motor processes, for example. So um, yeah, so the idea is that your uh, motor actions and your, your um, kind of um, um, reaction to affordances in the world 
they also specify the, the space which uh, wherein you map multisensory contingencies. And at the same time, the way you pay attention to these affordances is uh, important to how you uh, actively to them or, or with it. Um, and um, at the same time, um, attention can modulate the integration of uh, these different sensory streams. So, um, yeah, the main idea is just that these different mechanisms kind of are mutually dependent and um, that this is why we also find the uh, tight correlation between the different um, phenomenological categories. And uh, maybe to, to um, sum up these um, findings and these ideas, I think the main um, message is that the mode of our agentic and intentional engagement with the world um, specifies or defines the structure of the self-world boundaries, or you could also say of the self-world relatedness. So depending on whether you um, um, just sit down and reflect about yourself, or you engage in active um, bodily action, you have a different sense of um, self-world relatedness. And uh, accordingly, also just um, suspending any active engagement with the world um, will use to a suspension of um, the sense of being an, an embodied agent. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And